Here is Josh McDowell's book, How to Be a Hero to Your Kids. On page 190 in this book and following couple of pages, he talks about how parents need to strike a balance between controlling their children and showing support for their children. And then he mentions four parenting styles and he goes so far as to say that one of these four parenting styles is in every home. The first style is the autocratic. This is where the parents say, you'll do it my way or else. This gives the parents control of their children, but it doesn't show support for the children. The second parenting style is what he calls permissive where the parents say, you can do anything you want. Well, that shows a lot of support for the children, but it doesn't show any control of them. The third parenting style is neglectful, where the parents basically say, we don't care what you do. This shows no control of the children and no support for the children either. And then the fourth style is the relational where the parents say, I care about you, I'm listening to you, I want to understand you. Now this time around, we're gonna do things this way and, and here's the reason we're going to do that. So, I wonder which of those four <coughs> parenting styles you most relate to. <coughs> C. Everett Koop is the former uh, attorney general of, uh, I mean, uh, medical, um, <clears throat> former U.S. Surgeon General, and here in Leadership Journal, they quote him as saying, life affords no greater responsibility, no greater privilege than the raising of the next generation. Well, <clears throat> at the end of the book of Ruth, here in our passage today, Boaz and Ruth become the parents of a son named Obed. And their example, and the example of everyone in this passage, Ruth 4, 11 through 22, shows us four steps to raising godly children. And I'm excited about sharing those four steps with you now. <clears throat> Here's step number one. Cherish your children as gifts from God. The witnesses at the wedding between Ruth and Boaz told Boaz in, in verse 11 of chapter 4, May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. Rachel and Leah were the two wives of Jacob. And Jacob, and this is in the book of Genesis, became the father of 12 sons and one daughter. God changed Jacob's name to Israel and his 12 sons became the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel, God's chosen people. And so then these witnesses here at the wedding are wishing that Boaz and Ruth will have many children. Back in chapter one, we read about Ruth's first marriage. It lasted about 10 years and it resulted in no children. Now since Boaz is quite a bit older than Ruth, we learn in chapter three, he's past the time of peak fertility, and there may have been some concern about the couple's ability to have children. The friends understood this because they said there in verse 11, can we put that uh, PowerPoint up again? Yeah, may the Lord make the woman coming into your home, name, uh, namely uh, ha have children. And then in, in the very next verse, 12, it talks about the offspring the Lord gives you. So they believed, these witnesses, that any children Ruth and Boaz would have would be gifts from God. And then sure enough, in the next verse again, verse 13 this time, it says, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth 
to a son. So three verses in a row talking about how the Lord is the one who gives, gives couples the ability to have uh, <clears throat> children. So the inspired writer here in verse 13 agreed with the friends and God wants you and me to learn from this that children are gifts from him. And gifts are meant to be appreciated, <clears throat> aren't they? And therefore, we should cherish our children as gifts from God. Here's Psalm 127, verse 3, in the Good News Bible translation. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a real blessing. And as a father of three children myself, I say amen to that verse. I remember when Mary and I got married, and, I, and we had this conversation and I said to her, you know, about the time we were getting married, you know, we need to be on the same page and figure this out about the children, uh, how, many, how many children we plan to have. And for some reason, it just felt about the right number. I, I said to Mary, uh, what do you say that we ask the Lord for, for two children? And she says, yeah, that sounds like a good idea to me too. So, so we were agreed. We, we were going to, Lord willing, plan on having two children. Well, then we had our first child, Andrea, and she was so much fun that I said to Mary during Andrea's infancy, I said, look how much fun this is. We really shouldn't stop at two. What do you say we go for three? And Mary was in complete agreement about that, and she said, okay, let's try for three then. And the Lord was very kind and generous to us. And we, we did uh, bring three children into the world, and uh, they have been a total blessing to us, worth each one worth all, more than all the money in, in the world to us. And I enjoyed, while they were growing up, coaching them in youth sports, teaching them how to ride a bike, playing in the backyard with them, taking them to the mall, videotaping their birthdays, uh, Christmas mornings, their choir concerts, the plays that they were in, taking the family on vacation and watching them grow up. I've always kind of thought that after the wedding of each of our children, I would come home and pop these DVDs into the video player there and, and look back at all these things I videotaped when they were children uh, growing up and, and watch them as little children, but now that they're married and so forth, and then I would just bawl my head off. Well, that's just something I conceive of. Now, Ruth and Boaz were not the only people in the Bible to whom God gave the ability to conceive children. Rachel and Leah mentioned in verse 11, the, the two wives of, of uh, Israel, or Jacob, each gave birth, and in the book of Genesis, it says of both those women, God opened her womb. And then you remember Sarah, Abraham's wife, who gave birth to Isaac when Sarah was 91 years old. So she was past the time of giving birth. John the Baptist's mother, Elizabeth, was also old and advanced in years and unable to have children, but God gave her that son, John the Baptist. And then, of course, there was Mary, the mother of Jesus. She wasn't old or anything, but she also wasn't married, didn't know a man, and the Lord gave her a divine conception for, for Jesus. And then, too, even when couples are young and healthy, sometimes even they can't just conceive anyway, all of which brings us back to the bottom line, that every child conceived in every mother's womb is a gift from God and should be treated as such. Now here's the second lesson I learned in this passage about raising godly children. Nurture your children in a Christian home. When this baby was born to Ruth and Boaz, 
The women said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. That's verse 14. Now, earlier in this story of Ruth, Boaz is called the kinsman redeemer. But now it sounds like a new kinsman redeemer is coming up. And yes, in the very next verse, this new kinsman redeemer is identified as the, the boy, uh, the baby, o Obed. And so uh, Obed then, this child, becomes a type of Jesus Christ. Obed was Naomi's redeemer, and Jesus is our redeemer. Now on to verse 14. The women said, may he become famous throughout Israel. That's the same prayer that you and I have for Jesus. We want the world to know, love, worship, and serve Jesus. After all, Naomi and Ruth weren't the only people around who needed a redeemer. Everyone needs a redeemer. And that's who Jesus is for us, our redeemer. From, from sin. So uh, now into verse 15, it says regarding these, uh, this baby, he will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. Well, this is something that uh, every grandparent knows. There's something about the birth of a grandchild that just fills a grandparent's heart with, with explosive joy. Today, of course, Mother's Day and <clears throat> Uh, our daughter Andrea is, is having everybody over to her house in Fresno and she's the mother of our five grandchildren and I woke up this morning with the first thing on my mind today I get to see those five grandchildren of mine this is such a happy day <clears throat> Grand, grandparents uh, there, there's something about the birth of a grandchild that renews a grandparent's life now, more than a year ago, one of our young ladies, and she gave me permission to tell this story, Amaris Haston, came to the church here, just sort of, you know, running an errand or whatever, came into the office, and then panic came over her face, and I was here, and she said, oh, Pastor Tom, I've locked myself out of our van, and our two kids are locked in the van, and I don't have a spare key. So we, you know, rushed out there and there were Cadence and Braden inside. They were okay, but you know, they were locked inside. And Amaris is saying, what am I going to do now, this and that? So, you know, I was praying to the Lord, how do we solve this thing? So I finally just called a tow truck operator, knowing that they have tools that can get into locked cars. and. So the tow truck operator came and yes, he, he got the door open and the kids were fine and you know, it was only going on for about 20 minutes or something like that. Well, the grandfather of these two little children, Wayne Haston, also in our church, when he found out about this later, he grinned and said to me, Tom, if you had called me instead of the tow truck operator, I would have come with a hammer and smashed in the windshield to get my grandchildren out of there. Well, you know, that, that's true to life, uh, isn't it? There's, there's something about a grandchild that just runs over with joy in the grandparents' lives. And maybe these women who, who were saying this here in verse 15, he will renew your life and sustain you in your old age, Maybe they were grandmothers, and that's how they knew that this was going to happen for, for Naomi, too. Back in chapter 1 of the book of Ruth, Naomi said that her life was very bitter. But here now in chapter 4, where this baby is born, uh, her, her life is no longer bitter, but sweet. Back in chapter 1, she said, my life is empty, but now it's full. All right, and then here's what we read in verses 14, uh, 16 and 17. Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap, and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. 
This little baby had no idea how blessed he was. He had a father, a mother, and a grandmother who were all sold out to the Lord. Obed reminds me of Timothy, whom Paul described in 2 Timothy 1 verse 5, when he said, I've been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Well, it was going to be the same thing with Obed. He had a grandmother and a mother with sincere faith and a father with sincere faith, and he was going to learn that sincere faith too. <clears throat> the examples of Timothy in the New Testament and Obed in the Old Testament remind us that faith is more caught than it is taught. Now sometimes parents say, I want my children to make their own choices, so I'm not going to teach them about Jesus in the Bible when they're little children. I'll let them grow up and when they're old enough to make a mature decision, they, they can decide for themselves whether they want to be followers of Jesus or not. Well, the problem with that kind of thinking is that Satan does not wait for your children to grow older before he starts influencing them. I, I hope you've been praying for Abraham del Toro, a young man here in Dinuba who June the 20th is gonna start his trial for first degree murder. I'm completely convinced that Abraham del Toro is innocent. And the reason I bring him up is so that this illustration I'm gonna give right now, you won't think that I'm talking about Abraham. That this is not about him. But there's another young man who was caught on a videotape pulling out a gun in a convenience store and killing the convenience store clerk. You can't dispute it. It is obviously he and he did it and it's all right there. Well, anyway, that young man's parents, you know what they said? They said, we want everybody to know that this is not the way we raised our boy. We never raised him to be like that. And I completely believe them on that too. That's right, they, they didn't raise it. They didn't have to, why not? Because Satan had gotten a hold of their son and taught him to be a murderer. And that's why, again, you shouldn't wait as parents for your children to <clears throat> reach their own you know, adulthood and then make, make their uh, decision for, for Christ. And then maybe you might say, well, if I make my kids go to church when they're young, uh, I think they'll just rebel later on and they won't go to church when they're, you know, become adults. Well, you know, sometimes that does happen, but it really doesn't have to happen. I have two brothers and a sister, so there are four of us in my original family. My mother took all four of us kids to church every single Sunday of our lives, growing up as little children and through junior high school and high school, all these things. I'm the youngest of the four of us, and we're all still alive and so forth. And I would like to say that for all four of us, my two brothers, my sister, and me, church has always been an integral part of our lives. We, we have never checked out of, of church. We've always cherished our experiences in our respective churches and so forth. And so uh, it, it didn't uh, turn us against the church that we had to go every Sunday while we were growing up. Now, in my own mind, one way I tried to prevent my children's bitterness from the mandatory church attendance that Mary and I were putting on them was to get excited during the week 
about the things that were exciting them. For example, if they had a game on Saturday, well, I was either coaching the team or I was at least there watching the game and when the game was over, we all went out for ice cream. Or if my kids wanted to sleep over at a friend's house or have a friend sleep over at our house on a Friday night, I was always quick to say, yes, absolutely, great idea. Let, bring, bring him over, Let, let's do that. I wanted to be supportive of all the things they liked to do, hoping that they would follow me in what I wanted them to do on Sundays, namely, Sunday is the day that we go to church. So Mary and I have three kids. The youngest is almost 25 years old. And guess what? They, they have always gone to church. They're old enough now that, you know, we, we can't make them go to church anymore. But, but all three of them, you know, our daughter Leslie is still here in our church and she's in our worship team. Our son Tommy works in Monterey. He immediately found a church in Monterey and he absolutely loves it. And our daughter Andrea lives in Fresno with her family and they go to River Park Bible Church. And so it, it, it worked. And, and it isn't always the case that when you make your children go to church that, um, that when they're older, they'll, they'll rebel against it. Martin L. Gross wrote a book called The Psychological Society, and the subtitle is The Impact and the Failure of Psychiatry, Psychotherapy, and Psychoanalysis and the Psychological Revolution. Wow, that's quite an indictment he's giving. Here's what he says in that book. He writes, um, there are more than 60,000 guidance workers and 7,000 school psychologists who work in our American public education system, and many of them function as, here it comes, substitute parents. Many students need counselors, but no professional worker can take the place of a loving, faithful father or mother. Wow, well, well said. So uh, this shows the need for Christian parents to nurture their children in a loving, spiritual environment. And creating a Christian home is more than just bringing your kids to church on Sunday. When our kids were growing up, Mary and I prayed with them every morning before we all went our separate ways, them to school and so forth. And then in the evening, we would come together again and I'd read from a children's Bible storybook and then we'd pray together as a family uh, again. George Gallup in his Gallup polls has found out from surveys that of all the people who become Christians, two thirds of them make that decision before their 18th birthday. Wow. And so we need to seize our opportunities to lead our children to Christ when they're ripe for salvation. Okay, now on to the third step in raising godly children. Here it is. Train your children to become servants of the Lord. Verse 17 reads, The women living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. Now, Obed. Guess what that name means? It means servant. Ruth and Boaz wanted their son to become a servant of the Lord. Henrietta Mears, here's her biography, Dream Big. For many years, she was the director of Christian education at Hollywood Presbyterian Church. She was an extremely influential Christian in the 20th century. Now, her biographer says this. Let me read this little story to you. Henrietta believed and taught that surrender to Christ also meant service for Christ. Salvation as an end in itself had no meaning for her. 
Frequently, she would ask Sunday school workers at training conferences, what is the goal of your Sunday school? Almost invariably, some would answer, to lead boys and girls to Christ. No, she would reply emphatically to her startled audience. That, of course, is part of it, and you know the emphasis I place on evangelism. But if your task stops there, you will never be successful. Our job is to train men and women, boys and girls, to serve the master. They must feel that there is a task for them to do, that there is a place marked X for every person in God's kingdom. Here is my X. No one can stand on this place but me. <laughs> now I must help others to find their place. Jo God has a job for every Christian, and no one else can fulfill it. Well, I, I, I like that. That's pretty neat. Years ago, I was discipling a young man from, who lived in Erosi. His name is Dominic Hernandez. Dominic moved to Oregon. I kind of pretty much lost touch with him. But some time back, I got this phone call from him out of the clear blue. And so we're catching up with things. And then he says to me, hey, I've got some news for you. He said, uh, I think God is calling me into the full-time ministry. So I said to him, well, what, what form of ministry do you mean? And, and what I meant was, is God calling you to become a pastor or, or maybe a youth pastor or a parachurch leader or, you know, what, what kind of ministry? And Dominic answered, washing the feet of the saints. <laughs> Boy, did that ever bless me to, to hear that answer. That told me right there that Dominic Hernandez really does have a servant's heart. Every Christian boy or girl should be an Obed. They should serve their parents in the homes and serve God's people in the church. When I was 15 years old, I received my first service position in my church. They let me teach third grade Sunday school. 15 years old, and guess what? I've been teaching the Bible in the church nonstop ever, ever since then. And that helped put me on a path of lifetime service to Christ. And we need to get our children thinking about career service for the Lord on the mission field or in, in a church or in a parachurch uh, setting. When I was four years old, I knew I wanted to become a pastor. If you had said to me, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would not have said a cowboy or a baseball player or anything else. I would have said, I want to be a, a pastor. And I've served full time as a pastor for more than 39 years now. And I am so, so grateful. There's no higher job title in the Bible than servant of the Lord. When God talked about Moses, he said, Moses, my servant, not Moses, my leader. Only once did Jesus tell his disciples that he was leaving them an example. And, and when he did say that, this is my example, he, he washed their feet. He said that he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mark 10, 45. And the Apostle Paul said that when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, it will be because Christ made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Philippians 2, 7. And two verses before that, Philippians 2, 5, it says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. The best pastors are servants of the church. The best missionaries are servants of the people they're trying to reach. The best lay leaders are servants of the flock. The most godly husbands and wives are servants of each other. By our example and teaching, we need to instill a servant's heart in our children. And then here's the fourth 
and final step in this passage to raising God, godly children. Anticipate great things from God for your children. Now, regarding this baby born, Obed, verse 17 says, he was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Hey, wait a minute, wow. This story now is ending with a surprise. It's not just a love story about Boaz and Ruth. It's also the story of how Israel's greatest king, David, came into the world. And it's even more than that because in Luke 3.32, the name Boaz occurs in the genealogy of Jesus, or Obed rather, Obed the son of Boaz. So the story of how God paved the way for the Savior is found right here in Ruth chapter 4. Little did Boaz and Ruth understand when Obed was born that the Messiah would be coming from him. And little do we understand when we first read this book of Ruth that Ruth's marriage to Boaz would be a stepping stone toward our own salvation because the Savior would come from this, this line. And so we need to anticipate great things from God for our children. Does the thought ever cross your mind that that little girl of yours in the playpen in your home might grow up to found a Christian ministry that will lead thousands of people to Christ? Does the thought ever cross your mind that that little boy in your home who's got ice cream all over his face, someday he may translate the Bible into a language of an unreached people group? When I was about in the fifth grade or so, one Sunday morning my friend and I were sitting right here in the uh, front row, and we were, we were just carrying on totally oblivious to the sermon and you know, we were just totally insulting the pastor. I, I feel really bad about that now. And on this particular Sunday in church, you know, for like the first six or so rows, no one was sitting in those rows except my friend and I were. And we were in the front row all alone, carrying on, whispering back and forth, elbowing each other, telling jokes, giggling, laughing, so forth, all just, it was just awful. Well, then all at once, this man's name, I still remember his name, Norris Nelson, he got up out of his seat. He came down here to the second row. He sat right behind us and he put his hand on each one of our shoulders. <laughs> and I felt his right hand on, on my shoulder and my friend got his hand on his shoulder. And that was Norris Nelson's way of saying, you guys are not going to disrupt this service anymore. Well, just think, if you had told Norris Nelson that day, you know, Tom here, one of these kids who's carrying on, he's going to grow up to be a, a pastor someday. I think Norris Nelson may have said, God alone can do miracles. <laughs> So don't tell your children they'll never amount to anything. Don't accuse them of being good for nothing. Instead, say things to them like, I know God has a wonderful plan for your life, and I'm looking forward to watching it unfold. I believe the Lord is going to do great things through you. Quote verses to them like Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. You may not see now how the Lord is going to do great things through your children, but by faith anticipate great things. Okay, now let's move into the action steps here briefly. Maybe you say from your own parenting experience, I don't, I don't measure up as a parent because I'm barely on speaking terms with my own children. And, and that's very sad if that's the case. So that leads me to the first action step, and it's this. Humble yourself, apologize to your children, and ask for their forgiveness. Don't let pride drive a wedge between you and your children. If pride is there, 
That's a wall you have built and God wants you to dismantle it. Maybe it's just been simple neglect that you've shown to your children. You, you never put Bible reading or prayer or church worship into the family schedule. Well, I think you could still say to your kids, I believe in better late than never. I know I haven't done this before, but from now on, I, I wanna have family prayer in this home. I wanna have Bible reading in this home. I want us to go together to church as, as a family. Now, you, you may feel like you've made too many mistakes to salvage any spiritual life out of your family, but consider Naomi's problem at the beginning of the book. In chapter one, Naomi lost her husband. She lost both her sons, had no, no more children, no grandchildren. She was too old to have children. And yet at the end of the book, her friends said, Naomi has a son, chapter four, verse 17. So this leads right into my second and final action step. It's this, hope in God in your hopeless situation. Now I know parents who tried to practice spiritual disciplines with their children after years of neglecting to do that and sometimes the kids just didn't buy into it, they didn't change, nothing changed. But other times God does work a new way of life and however your children respond, whether favorably or not, God will bless you for confessing your past neglect and setting the right example. So therefore, hope in God in your hopeless situation. Make your next step with your children a step of faith. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these gifts you give us of children. And even for, for some here who have no biological children of their own, Lord, thank you that they can have an input into children's lives through our Awana ministry, through our Sunday school program, our, our nursery care, uh, all kinds of ways like that. Help us to make an eternal difference for the next generation. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.